Well, all right, let's dive into it together. Again, if you just t- came in a little bit late, you just tuned in. My name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor here. I always want to tell you what our mission statement is, and that is we exist to lead everyone to discover Jesus and follow him fully. Uh, we believe that everybody should have a one in their life, whether you are young, old, in between. We One person that you're praying for, trying to connect with, trying to, sh- to share Jesus with, inviting them to church, walk alongside them so that they can discover who he is follow him fully with their life, and then, you, and then they lead somebody to do the very same thing. So again, that's why we exist. And if you're joining us online, thank you so much for being here with us today. I believe your chat host right now is Melissa. So Melissa, thanks for being the chat host for us online. She's going to be putting some links in there for you if you want to connect with her throughout the service, and she'd be happy to do that. But I really am glad you're back for week two of the series. And it is called Simposco, and we're looking at the book of 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles with you or your Crossroads Grace apps, I'd encourage you to open to 2 Timothy chapter 2. But wait, there's more because you get a bonus sex scripture to be able to look at today, and that is Acts chapter 16. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and Acts chapter 16, go ahead and start to find those right now. Don't worry, Melissa's going to be putting a link for you, Crossroads Online, in the chat right about now, and you'll be able to connect with us and jump in with us in just a moment. But last weekend, my friend, Pastor Darren Youngstrom was here. He's from New Vintage Church in Santa Clara. Did a great job kicking off our series as he looked at what it looks like to suffer for the gospel. And it's a very important thing to consider and be able to wrestle with as you suffer for the gospel. Now, what I love that he said, though, is he said that the gospel is always worth the risk because it's the hope of the world. I love that. It's so important for us to remember that, to stay grounded and rooted in that. If you missed that message last week for some reason, we'd encourage you to go back online and uh, listen to it. It's good stuff. You, you'll definitely be worth listening to. But you might be wondering, if you came in late or just even from last week, you're probably wondering, what in the world is this, like, simposco word is it? Like, what in the world is that? Well, simposco is a Greek word. You can impress your friends later. But it means to suffer with. And the word sympathy comes from the root word of simposco. You could probably see it already. And Paul uses simposco several times in this letter to Timothy, uh, to his little men- his mentee, his name is Timothy, a couple times in the letter. And several, several times throughout the letter, what uh, Paul will challenge Timothy to do is he'll say, hey, join me, join Paul in suffering. He's saying that as a Christian, that there are times where we are asked to or we will experience suffering in our life. But the fact that Paul uses the word simposco is very important. Because so often I think that when we think of suffering, we think that it's something we have to endure ourselves. Like we just need to grin, we gotta bear it, we gotta suck it up, buttercup, until it's over with. It's all about us getting it done. But Paul is very clear that we are not to suffer alone, that we are to suffer with others or simposco. And that creates a whole new dynamic when it comes to what we go through in our life. That when God calls us to live life together, which he does, that also includes all the parts that aren't so fun, the parts that are painful, the parts that are really difficult. Because if we just are honest with ourselves, it's easy to be a Christian and to be around people when, when life's good. You know, it's easy to walk along people in their life when things are, the job's good, the kids are healthy, friendships are right, your grades are really well, uh, you're generally hashtag winning in life. I mean, it's easy, it's almost effortless to walk alongside somebody when that's happening in their world. But when we encounter things that are hard, that changes things. When your health is a little not as good, maybe when you get in a, a, a fight with your spouse, you start to go through seasons when you start to question your faith. Things are tight financially. Your, your kids start to question things about themselves. See, those are the moments where, where deep suffering and challenges come in that as believers in Jesus, we don't abandon other people, but in fact, we actually suffer with other people. We show simposco. So today we're going to look at another angle of this idea of simposco in 2 Timothy as Paul points out yet another way for us to, to suffer with one another. So I want us to pick up 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's start in verse 1. We'll begin our, our dive in there today. Uh, now Paul is speaking. He says, you then, who the you is Timothy, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now there's a couple of points, to, things to point out just in these couple of verses that we get to that are important to note. Now, the first is is that notice that Paul calls Timothy my son, my son. 
Paul is describing a very intimate relationship that he has with Timothy, which is very important to understand the dynamic of 2 Timothy. And we're going to get into some more details of that here in a minute, but important to look at that little small detail. Now, the second thing to consider is that Paul starts off by saying something interesting. He says to Timothy, hey, be strong at the opening of chapter 2. Now, I don't know about you, but when I suffer, sometimes I have a hard time being strong. Anybody else, like, you have a hard time just being strong? It's okay. Like, all three of us in the room are fine, right? But a, a lot of times when we go through things, I lose my fight. I feel pretty weak when I'm doing that. And, and so, so I can say that when I hear Paul say, hey, just be strong, I don't really like what he has to say. And then when I hear him say, well, you should suffer with others, honestly, here's what I want to do. I want to give him all my suffering. You just take it. Like, I'll just dump it on you. I don't want to deal with it at all. You take it. Here, here you go. Now, I don't know if that's your experience, but it's not how it works with me. Because just because I suffer with someone, it doesn't mean that somehow I can, like, have someone else carry my burden for me, and I sit on the sidelines and say, oh, just let me know how that plays out. I'd love, you know, let me know later. No. No, Paul says, hey, Timothy, you, in the middle of suffering, you be strong, keep fighting, don't let up. And here's the reason why so important. Because sometimes, sometimes suffering brings out things in us that we never knew were there. And if we give up too early, we never get to see those things surface to the, to the, to the top of our life for us to experience. And there's a fancy Christian word that you can impress your friends with that's part of this process. It's called sanctification. Yeah, sanctification is this big word. It just means the process by which we become more like Jesus, slowly but surely, day by day, minute by minute. And often this process is accelerated when we suffer because suffering has the potential to bring us closer to God quicker if we would just allow that to happen. But we do need to be very careful about what Paul is calling Timothy, and that's also us, what he's calling us to be strong in. And he's calling us to be strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus. So what that means is our strength is found in Jesus. No matter what you're going through, it is by the grace of Jesus that you or I will get through what we're going through. It's never going to be by our strength. And then, if you think about it, when you have multiple people that love Jesus, which means that you have multiple people that have the same grace of Jesus inside them, that is even more powerful when you consider all that together. And so I want you to see what it looks like for this to take place in real life. So I want you to take a minute. I want you to listen to my friend Larry's story as a way for you hearing God working in the middle of his life, in the middle of a very, very difficult season. Listen to his story. My kidneys failed in, they were failing in 98, and they finally failed in the year 2000. I was on dialysis for 10 months, and then my dad popped up in my life, and he was a match. So I got my first kidney transplant from my dad. They told me back then that a transplant typically lasts about eight years. Eight years went by, and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna tell you if you don't, <laughs> if you haven't figured it out, <laughs> keep going. In 2018, my transplanted kidney for my dad started to fail, so I had to start dialysis again. And I figured, you know, I only waited 10 months the last time, I'm gonna get a match, and you know, was, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be good again. My wife and I came up with a plan so I can find a donor faster. So we went to Disneyland because there's so many people there and we all, we had t-shirts. We got a ton of people calling to try to be donors. For a while, it was very busy and people were getting tested. People from my church, Crossroads, they were getting tested. And you know, some people would come back like, hey Larry, uh, I did as much as I could, but I, you know, I take medication for this and I can't do it, I stopped me there. I'm like, okay, you know, I understand how God works. So when it comes, it comes. But I thought it was gonna come faster. So four years later, I have become sicker. Throughout the process of me being on dialysis the last four years, again, I'm an angry man. (laughs) Cause I'm hurting inside. But people's hearts are touched. You know, and they hear the story and they see me and my kids and I got a phone call from a guy in Spain <laughs> trying to figure out how to come to America to get tested. But he couldn't go through with the process. But I'm like, God reaches out wherever 
going through dialysis and, you know, having your blood cleaned and being tired all the time. And, you know, you can't do the things you want to do with your kids when you're a dad. And it's rough. But the journey for this kidney match thing, it's amazing to see how people work, how God works through people. People are coming up to us at Disneyland. Hey, can I pray for you? Put your, you know, they put your hands on you and pray. And you receive the love from a total stranger. The world is my community. That's how I feel. Because if you can call America <laughs> from Spain <laughs> to see if you can give me a kidney, God's working. Although I'm angry, I'm grateful, and I know that God has a plan. We just have to stand firm and know that he's there, even when you think he's not, you think he's busy with a typhoon, he's got you too. He's got everything at the same time. It's my boy Larry, right? Yeah? We love you, Larry, man. We love you, buddy. We love Larry. So hey, let's, let's get him a kidney, y'all. Let's just get him a kidney. You gotta take a screenshot, whatever you gotta do, but let's get my boy a kidney uh, in li- online in person because uh, Larry's a fighter. Larry's a fighter. He's the epitome of someone that's strong in the face of suffering. And whether you like it or not, like you're somebody that we look up to, not because you're six foot, thousand inches tall, but, but because, boy, I mean, I just love, I love you, man. I love your commitment to Jesus. I love that you're unflinching no matter what you're going through. That's important, and, and you're, an, you're an inspiration to so many people. And, and you know that God knows that we need examples for us to be able to look at, to know what, how it looks to suffer for him well, which is why I love how Paul kind of continues in 2 Timothy. We look in verse 3 through 6 in chapter 2. He says, he says, join with me in suffering. There it is. He says, like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. So here Paul gives us three illustrations to describe what it looks like, the perseverance in suffering that Timothy was going to need to have. And he uses a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer to do, so, to do that. And all of those three things describe the product of what suffering provides or what it brings. So a soldier is, you know, you have to go through basic training and you have to spend time away from your family. You might even have to get into a battle or a war. Why? So that you can win the battle, you can protect our freedoms, all of that. And an athlete, you suffer in practice. You have to go to weight training. You have to figure out how to go to school, how how to do all this and that. You might even have injuries you have to overcome. Why? To win the championship. That's your goal. A farmer, goodness, we know about this. You suffer with hard weather, long nights, away from family time, all to produce a crop at the end of the day. So each of these know that suffering is a part of reaching a certain goal. This is why Paul uses these examples. He wants to remind Timothy that, hey, suffering will happen, but even in suffering, there's a purpose. And Paul can have confidence in in saying that because he's been through a lot of stuff. He's basically the president of the suffering club, okay? Paul has been in jail more times than Snoop Dogg, Martha Stewart, and every governor in Illinois combined, all right? Okay? There's a Hilton Rewards membership, frequent prison stays thing. He'd have a billion points. He'd have the fuzzy robe. He'd have all the stuff, okay? but, But here's what Paul knew after all that prison stuff. He knows that there can be purpose in suffering. It's coming up right about now, right? There can be purpose in suffering and I will tell you that when I wrote that as part of my message I didn't like that I wrote that I was like I don't really like that but it's true it's true I mean but let's look a little closer at what this looks like as we as we look in the book of Acts now that was that other spot that I told you to hold on to Acts chapter 16 so flip on over there and we'll see how Paul is familiar with suffering and and in prisons and all this kind of stuff we've been talking about. Now, Acts 16 is not just a cool story to look at, but it's also the place that we learn where Paul meets Timothy, perhaps for the first time. In Acts chapter 16, verse 1, we get a chance to start it. It says, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. That's Timothy. 
Paul wanted to take him along the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So here we get a chance to learn a little bit more about, about Timothy. Uh, again, Timothy is the one that Paul is writing to in 2 Timothy. And we learned last week that Timothy's life, his development to know who God was, came through the, the, the influence of his grandmother Lois and his mom Eunice. But we also could see that Paul had a huge impact on this young man's life. But what we learn here in Acts chapter 16 is that Timothy's mom was Jewish, which means that she was a follower of God, but also says that she was a believer, so she believed in Jesus, but that his father was Greek. So this means that Timothy comes from a family that was mixed. It was a mixed religiously and mixed racially also. But since Timothy was from a mixed religious home, in order to kind of validate that Timothy was a, had fully converted to Judaism, was a follower of Jesus to the other Jews that were in the area, Paul seemed to think it was necessary to circumcise him, okay? And y'all thought getting baptized a little water for the people to publicly declare your, your love of Jesus was difficult? You could do it differently. There's some other ways that this could happen, right? But, but Timothy went varsity, varsity level commitment, got circumcised as an adult, and he did that because of his deep desire to follow God, no matter what the cost, no matter what the inconvenience or discomfort. So, so Paul brings Timothy with him after he probably recovered from the whole circumcision thing, right? He brings him on the trip to plant churches and to tell people about Jesus. Now, let me push pause for just a second here, just, just for a second. When you're looking to engage your one, and we talked about that one, one person you want to learn it to, to, to share Jesus with, have a relationship with, invite to church. When you're learning that, to try to create that relationship, can I tell you, don't overcomplicate it. Also, don't be weird. Don't be weird and don't overcomplicate it. Because sometimes connecting with that person is as simple as inviting them into things that you're already doing. Inviting them to lunch after practice at, at the dorms. Right? Bring, bringing them to Home Depot with you as you're going to buy whatever. Going to hang out with you as you watch your kids play soccer. Just create ways to live life together with them so that you can show who Jesus is to you in all context of your life. That's what Paul did. It's like, hey, I'm going on this trip. Come on, Timothy. He brought Timothy on the trip, poured into him that whole time. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Just create community with your one. Okay, that's just a side note. But I think that's important to see that Paul's relationship with Timothy was very, was very intentional, and it's also very helpful for us to understand. But one day, as Paul and this group were kind of going town to town, learning different things, they, were, they, were, they started to be followed by a young girl who was possessed by a spirit. So that's got to be crazy to think about. But she was being used by her owners to tell the fortunes of people, and they were making a lot of money off of that. Now, don't sugarcoat this scene for a second. Don't, don't, don't be fooled. This girl was being trafficked. She was being used by these people. And so when we meet up with her, she had been annoying Paul and all of his friends, taunting him as they walk, as they're traveling to this place of prayer, it tells us in Acts. Well, well, Paul must have had like a bad burrito or something the night before, because like when we meet up with him, he was like sick of it after this girl had been following them for days, and he finally gets fed up with it. And look at chapter 16, look at verse 18, if you flip over there. And there it says that finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. Paul turns around, casts out a demon. All of a sudden, this young girl is free. She's finally able to live without the curse and without this spirit in her life. That's, that's amazing stuff. You'd think that that's a slam dunk. Everybody'd be like, yeah, that's amazing. But not everybody was thrilled about it, especially her scumbag owners of this girl. So, so look what happens in verse 19. Verse 19 says, when her owners, the scumbags, realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. So the owners realize that their meal ticket is gone, and so they flip out. They take Paul and Silas, they drag them in front of basically the popo, and they're having, they demand that they are now punished. Now keep in mind, though, something. Keep in mind, there's a high probability that Timothy is watching all of this go down. Because between Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 16, there's no indication that Timothy's left Paul. But rather, most likely, he's still traveling with him. 
So this means that as all this Paul, Silas, magistrate thing is going down, Timothy very well, if it was now, be holding the cell phone, videotaping the whole thing happening. And this is going to become really important in just a second. But, but keep reading about what happens next in verses 22 through 24. Verse 22 says, The crowd joins in on the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them, Paul and Silas, to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailers were commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. So Paul and Silas are thrown a beaten. And we're talking bad stuff. It says they stripped them naked. They were beaten with rods. We're talking brass knuckles, flogging whole nine yards, and then thrown into jail. But not the jail with like honey buns and cigarettes and that kind of thing. No, no, we're talking Roman jail. It says on the inner part of the jail, like the inner part, and in these inner parts, they would use Roman stocks as a version of torture. They would fashion their arms and their legs in these different contorted positions to inflict the most amount of pain possible on the person. And if you consider that all of this takes place after he was flogged and beaten with rods, I can't tell you the, the, the amount of suffering that Paul would have went through just by being in this, this place. So, so again, Timothy's seeing all of this take place in front of him. All because of why? Because Paul and Silas had the audacity to free a young girl from a life of abuse and manipulation and possession. But yet here's Paul, suffering for doing what's right, and now he finds himself surrounded by criminals and prisons and all kinds of crazy stuff. But can I just ask you for a moment? Anybody feel like that sometimes? Like in your life, like you feel like you're being stretched right now? You're, you're contorted by what you're going through? You're suffering, but honestly, you're suffering for things that are, seem to be really good things and you're doing the right things? And the truth is that sometimes we do suffer for things that are not our fault. We suffer for things that are right and even good. But just because they're right and good doesn't make them any less hard. It's still hard. Paul gets it. He's in jail. He's suffering for what? Helping a young girl. Check out what happens next. Verse 25. Verse 25 is so good. Verse 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open. Everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. <laughs> now you've got to love Paul, okay? When I get to heaven, fast pass lane, right to Paul. That's what I want to see, okay? Right, because that dude is in stocks, He's bleeding from his beating. He's probably concussed. He's cramping up. He's in excruciating pain. But despite all the suffering and all the pain, Paul breaks out to a Chris Tomlin concert in the middle of the jail. You know what I'm saying? It's like one of those annoying clown punching bags, you know, and you like hit him, you know, like boom. It's like, then sings my soul, right? Wham! <laughs> How great is our God, you know, wham, Hosanna, right? Just over, like, shut up, just, right? You can't, he can't keep him down. And he must have really been rocking for that day because all of a sudden earthquakes start happening, you know? Okay, that was God, that wasn't Paul. But anyway, right, he's worshiping God and God is responding in this moment. Prison doors fly open, handcuffs fall off. Paul and Silas could break out of this joint right like that. But it does create a bit of a dilemma for the guard. So the guard is like a soldier. His commander told him to do a certain thing. Here's your one job. You need to do this. And, and it's their mission to accomplish the job. And if, you, you, like, don't, if that doesn't happen, especially since you're in Rome, your life is going to be on the line. However, what most soldiers would do when they knew that death was coming on them, they would take their own life so that they wouldn't receive the embarrassment or the punishment that came with their failure. So, so this is what happens. These prison doors fly open. The prisoners could go free. Soldiers convinced that his life is over, and so he gets ready to, to kill himself. But, but look what happens, actually, if you jump down to, to verse 28. It says, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. 
The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. So right before the guards does anything, Paul says, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. It's all good, it's all good. We're all still here. Just don't, don't hurt yourself. Which is, if, if we were in Paul's shoes, I don't know if we'd say that. I mean, this guy nearly killed you. He was going to continue to hurt you in ways that you can't even imagine. So if we're honest with ourselves today, there's a huge part of us that would probably have ran out of that jail cell at the first possibility, and whatever that dude decided to do to himself would have been between him and God. Because when it seems like we are suffering unjustly, when we are being hurt, when we're in the middle of our mess, the last thing we want to do is give the source of our pain any mercy. Tell me this isn't true. We want the source of our suffering to suffer. We want the source of our suffering to suffer. We want whatever it is that is bringing us the amount of hurt, the amount of suffering that's happening, we want them to suffer too. We want retribution. We want justice. We want it now. We want our pain to be reciprocated onto the person or the thing that's causing it. But that's not what Paul did. In fact, Paul chose something completely different. Paul chose to not let the source of his suffering suffer. He chose not to have payback. In fact, he chose something even more powerful than payback. He chose compassion. And because of that compassion that he showed, look what happens. Verse 30. Verse 30, it says, he, that's the guard, Then brought them, that's Paul and Silas, out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. When they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house, at that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he had all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. I can never read that and not be blown away. It is just crazy to think about. Because because Paul chose not to let the source of his suffering suffer, something profound happened. He had the chance to share Jesus with them. He had a chance to see the power of the gospel message move in the most unlikely of circumstances. And the same can be true for you and me. I want us to really wrestle and think about this one idea today. That choosing not to let the source of our suffering suffer creates an opportunity to share about the Savior. Now I want to be very clear here though. This does not mean that you go back in that abusive relationship. It doesn't mean that you don't press charges for what they've done. It doesn't mean that you just forget what they've done and move on with your life. No, no. It simply means this. It means that you remember you have a choice. You can choose to let your suffering define you, or you can be defined by Jesus. You can choose Jesus over revenge. You can use even the hardest moments in your life for the purpose of pointing people to the grace of Jesus Christ. Paul got to see, he got to actually see the source of his suffering come to know the Savior, Jesus Christ. And even though in that moment that he probably had to limp to be able to get in that river, maybe had to have his arm all jacked up as he's making his way in, maybe he was maybe still injured from the beating that this very soldier had caused him, Paul still got in that water and baptized him and his whole family. All because Paul used his suffering to point people to the Savior. And remember, Timothy was there to see it all. The whole thing. Which brings us all the way back to 2 Timothy and what Paul is now trying to say to Timothy. Remember in verse 3 he says, Join with me in suffering, Paul says, in Sapasco. It's as if Paul is reminding Timothy, Hey, remember Acts 16? 
He's saying, hey, remember when we suffered together? Remember when we actually suffered for doing what is good? Remember when I was in prison and the whole Chris Tomlin thing, right? Remember the earthquake that came? Remember when Silas and I, we could have left, but we didn't? And then remember, like you remember, Timothy, when we got to baptize that guard and his whole family? Do you you remember that? Do you remember how hard that was? He says, Timothy, you've got to remember that. Because you need to know that suffering will still happen. But you've got to be strong. You've got to keep going. You've got to remember that suffering can have a purpose. You have to remember not to look to bring suffering to the cause of your suffering, but to point them to the Savior. And you need to remember, Timothy, you're not alone. Which is why Paul says this, Starting in verse seven, he would say this. He says, reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Paul says that the other reason that we don't inflict the the, the suffering on the cause of our suffering is because, because of Jesus actually, because of what he did for us on that cross. Because even as Paul writes this letter to Timothy, you should probably know he's back in jail, and he says, I'm in in chains for Jesus. But even there he knows that the purpose for his suffering can still be found. But we also need to know something, that just because he's back in jail and he's suffering, it doesn't mean that he's defeated, and it doesn't mean that suffering wins. (laughs) No, not, not, not at all. That's why the next part of that verse is so important. Look, the remainder of it. He says, He says, but but God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul says, you know what? I might be in chains for Jesus, but I can assure you that God's word and the grace of Jesus is not in chains. It is freer than it's ever been. It is truer than it's ever been. It is as real as as it ever has been. He's saying Jesus is still ruling. Jesus is reigning. Jesus is restoring the lives of his people. And for someone suffering right now, you need to hear that. For someone stuck in the stocks of life for things that they didn't do, you needed to hear that. For someone in the middle of suffering and for something that is good, you needed to hear that right now. Because just because you might feel like you're in the middle of the storm, that you're trying to find your way out, that you're looking down the hallway of life and you're not sure if you could see the light that's there, I will tell you with 100% certainty, you are not alone. That Simposco is real. That God will use whatever you're going through for things greater than you could ever imagine that temporal challenges in this life are worth enduring for the eternal reward that is in heaven later. But the choice, the choice is up to us. Paul outlines this. The last couple verses we'll look at today, verses 11 through 12. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, oh, he remains faithful. For he cannot disown himself. It means the choice is up to you. It's up to me. Of how we will deal with our suffering and whether we will look for purpose or not. My friend Larry, who you heard from earlier, He was in a group that I led a few years ago. Every year I try to connect with about 12 guys and um, we we live life together and we just kind of read a book a month and hang out and read the Bible and just talk about Jesus for a whole year. And the way I put those groups together is not very anything scientifically. I just kind of pray and God puts certain people on my mind and my heart and I invite them out. The 12 that say yes, they're the ones that we do life with. And so when I sit around the table for the first time, it's not like I'd handpicked all these different people, but... So they were at my house and we were sitting around our table and going around introducing ourselves, who we were, what we did, things like that. Uh, it comes a time for Larry. Larry shares his story and shares a story about his kidney and about how he needs a transplant and just how hard life really was. He was just so honest. I loved it. 
we got done eating and we prayed and uh, everybody went home. A couple days later, one of the guys in the group, his name is John, uh, John reach out, reaches out to me and I, I even kind of reached out to him and said, hey man, how you doing? He goes, well, it's kind of crazy. After that first group, um, you should probably know that when I was driving home, I felt like I was really not feeling well and my, my legs started to swell up really, really big. And so uh, I realized that I was probably in trouble. So I went to the emergency room uh, in Manteca and he went there and tried to get the fluid under control. But in the testing, they found out that his kidneys were failing and he needed a kidney transplant. And so in that moment, it was one of those God wink moments, I think for Larry and I know for me, that God had orchestrated for two people to be in the same group at the same time that didn't know each other. But now John was able to connect with Larry and Larry could see the purpose in his pain potentially to help John walk through this hard season of getting a kidney transplant. And it doesn't make it even that easier for Larry, but it certainly allows him to see that there is purpose in that suffering. And maybe for you in your life, you can start to see where there's purpose in your life suffering too. If you can just re- Focus your eyes, not on yourself, but put them on Jesus. To remind yourself, to, be rem- to remember what he's done and to connect with him in a deeper way. At this time, we're gonna be considering communion, but as we hear this song sung, I just pray that maybe you have your eyes closed and hear the words wash over you. But maybe on the other side, you can just have a moment with God that, that wrestles with the suffering you're going through. And maybe ask a really hard question that says, God, can you show me the purpose in this? And maybe it doesn't happen right away, but over time that he will. If you'll trust him, if we'll allow him to work through us, if we'll allow to suffer with each other. Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now. I know in a room this size and those that are joining us online, there's so many stories happening. And I just pray that you would meet us in our individual places. Help us now to hear how much you love us. Help us to remember you well. And God, I pray that you would, just, you would just really meet us in the pain, meet us in the heart, heartache, meet us in the suffering, and slowly over time, direct us towards what your will might be and what purpose there might be there. Help us to have maturity beyond our years. Help us to cling to you that much more. And help us always to remember the cross that proves how much you love us and how much you give for us. We give you the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen.